Hey, how are you? My name is Emilio and thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, I work in technology and I absolutely love it. And we're gonna talk about some really cool stuff today. Before we do get into that, please remember as always to subscribe, clicking on that notification bell and on the button so that you don't miss out on anything. talk a little bit around the DRP and the BCP. DRP being Disaster Recovery Plan, BCP Business Continuity Plan. Two documents that work hand in hand to make sure that a business is protected in the event of something going wrong. The BCP is almost like the parent document. The BCP contains the DRP, but the BCP will contain information that is relevant for all the organization. Every department will feed into the BCP, contains information about staff, where they live, how to contact them, contains information around what happens if our finance goes down, what do we do, what happens if our marketing is unavailable, what do we do, where do we meet in the event of something going wrong. So that's sort of what the BCP will do. You wanna ensure the business continuity. Can the business continue to function in the event of something going wrong. Perfect example, this thing called COVID-19 happened. A lot of businesses were not prepared for this. Some were, some weren't. A lot of businesses, including companies that I've worked with, had to invoke their BCP, had to invoke their DRP. We're now in this new world. How do we continue the business operating while working remotely now? All of our staff are now working in a different way. They're working remotely. Do we have the things in place to be able to continue to them, continue for them to continue working? BCP then contains the DRP. The DRP is almost like the IT document that sits within the BCP. Talks about all things tech, right? If I use this fun example of COVID again, the DRP needs to ensure that in the event of a pandemic, that all of our systems can continue to operate. Our staff can continue to operate. Our staff working remotely can still access all the same systems they could access as if they were in the office. Some, of course, may be in a reduced capacity. Some may not be possible at all when a DRP is invoked, all right? So BCP, DRP. But we're now going to cross over and show you essentially what a DRP looks like, maybe give you some recommendations around the structure and the contents of a DRP. Here is an example of uh, what it could look like and the, the areas that you may want to include within your DRP. Now, of course, this is completely customizable to you. You add the relevant information that is for your organization. Some of the stuff that we're discussing here may not even be relevant to your organization. So you want to customize that specific to where you are Uh, responsible, okay? So you've got the DRP, here's just the heading page with the actual date of that DRP. Um, The next area right here is around the introduction. What is this document for? Now remember that the DRP may be read by non-technical people, or it may just be technical people, but just give a good introduction of what this document is actually about, all right? Uh, An overview of uh, the DRP, what it sets out, accompanying documents. So the DRP generally is not going to be a standalone document. So what I've said right here is that the DRP is a comp- is accompanied with a group of documents together forming the disaster recovery pack. Okay, so the DR pack is going to include the business continuity plan, the disaster recovery plan, which is this document, the data backup and recovery policy, all right, which we're not going to show you, but essentially this is a policy that shows you how to Well, how are backups set up? How are data backups? How are you backing up our servers? How often? Where are the backups going to? And how do I restore things? How do I restore my domain controller? How do I restore my email? How do I restore my files and my key applications? Because it's great to invoke DRP. uh, Well, sorry, it's it's great to have a DRP and invoke disaster recovery or DR, but if you don't know how to restore everything, if this document is now gone, then you've got problems. You want to include that pack altogether. Of course, you want to include a list of all of your contacts, all of your vendors, all of your providers, all of your third parties, anybody that is part of the engagement. So if you need to, if your data center has gone down and your equipment is now damaged, well, you need to know, you need to contact this particular vendor to purchase new equipment 
or to get some recovery software or whatever it may be. Then an up-to-date list of our IT assets. This is very important because um, what, in, what happens in the event of the building burning down or something catastro- you know, catastrophic happening, you're getting flooding, you're damaging all your equipment, well, it's good for you to know exactly, well, what did you have, um, what were you looking after? And if your asset register is just a spreadsheet sitting on a server or it's some application software sitting on, on your infrastructure and that is now damaged, well, how are you going to know all of that or all of your hardware? when it was purchased, what the specs are, um, serial keys of your software, all this sort of stuff, right? You wanna make sure that you have an exported copy of this on hand, part of the DRP. And that may mean that you export this potentially every month, and then you update the disaster recovery pack accordingly with the updated list of this. And that's true of really of any document, right? If your IT team is changing the process or they're getting some new software to back up and recover their data, you then update this policy and then you update that as part of the pack. So you want to make sure that the pack has always got the most up-to-date version of anything that is being uh, that is updated in the system. Where can I find copies of this plan? Now you you want to keep a copy of this in more than one location. So it's going to be stored on the file, you know, on the primary file server. That is the first point I'm going to go get to it. And of course, the file server may be only accessible, or this particular folder may only be accessible by IT, or it could be accessible by more people. It's also going to be in our secondary office domain controller server, so in a off-site location. And then you may also want to have printed copies. Hey, very old school to print documents out, but what if all your digital copies have been infected? What if you had a huge malware go through your entire system and all of your systems are down? Well, it's not going to do you any good if all of that has been impacted. Uh, It's probably good that you have printed copies of this Uh, as well so that you can actually refer to a printed copy. And what is the purpose uh, of the DRP, the importance of the DRP? We then got in here some assumptions um, and other considerations. So you're assuming that the DRP is this and this and this, it's not this, this and this. So you wanna add some stuff in there. Then we form what's called the disaster recovery panel. So this now is the body of the document that now forms, well, who is part of this panel? Right, the DR panel is a group of people consisting you know, principally of key personnel with relevant decision-making abilities. So of course, you go and add a bit more information, but these are the powers that be. These are the people who have final say. These are the people who make sure that the, that the, the DRP, the, the, everything that's part of the DR is done to the standards that are expected in the organization and that is signed off by this team. Okay, this could be the board could be the board member uh, group uh, with the director of IT or the IT manager or whatever it may be. And then they will work together that form this panel. And they're now responsible. So all, all this responsibility should not fall on the IT manager. It falls to a group of people who are responsible for making sure that this thing is kept up to date, that it is accurate, that it is correct. Because at the end of the day, if they can't invoke this correctly, it's a group decision that's been agreed on by a group, not just a single individual, okay? So we wanna include their name, their responsibility within this particular DR panel, and then their contact information. All right, so how do we contact this person um, outside of you know, perhaps just what's in their signature, for example? Then you've got the disaster recovery team. So this is different to the panel. The panel, remember, are the people who are the decision makers. They're the ones who are reviewing the actual DR plan itself, making sure that it is accurate, making sure that's up to date, all the information is in, in there correct. The DR team or the DR recovery team, the disaster recovery team are the team of people, specialist leads in the event of a disaster. So now disaster has been encountered. You're now going to invoke the DRP. So the powers that be have said, yep, this is now a disaster. We need to invoke the disaster recovery plan. And this is the team of professionals that are now going to be contacted and involved to restore operations, okay? They are now the leads in this disaster to restore all the operations that are needed, okay? So you've got the disaster recovery director, their overall recovery of an incident. So these are the people who are um, responsible for the recovery of the incident and the restoration of business systems and functionality. Okay. Now, I've kept this very, very basic from a high level, but you want to give specific roles and responsibilities to each member of this DR 
team. Okay, they need to have a specific role because the last thing that you want is chaos. You don't want to be making this stuff up as you go. Let's say there's a huge malware outbreak or there's a huge event, there's a flooding, the whole office is down and people don't have any direction as to who needs to do what. So that's what this DR team, well, at least at least identifying and you know stipulating here who is who, uh, make sure that very easily you know straight away, well, these are the people that are going to be doing what. The DR director, the DR coordinator, so these are the people who are um, directing and responding to the incident, coordinating the entire recovery process, and they will be, of course, reporting to the director. Then you've got the DR management team. So these are specialist team members and vendors, as well as allocating priorities for the members of the team. So these three roles, to an extent, are management type of positions. So the management team, so for example, there could be um, a desktop manager, there could be an infrastructure manager, there could be a help desk manager, there could be a development manager, and all these people are part of the management team who then report into the coordinator who's managing the entire disaster recovery event, who then reports into the director who is ultimately responsible. Then you fall into the now technical roles. So these roles would generally report into the management team and not necessarily report from a day-to-day BAU perspective, but they report into the management team and then likewise the coordinator and the director, but only in the event of a disaster, of course. So you've got the network team. They're all the network specialists, the systems, the network links, the firewalls, etc. The systems guys and the applications team. So anybody that is involved with the servers, with all the infrastructure, the apps themselves, this could include developers. And of course, you could break this down into the developers as one set, the systems as one set. You could even have the database team in a separate set, the servers a separate set, the storage a different set. But in my case, I've just included them all together. But you may want to get very, very granular if you are responsible for a much larger team with a lot more IT professionals. And then the backup and restore team. So these are now the people who are you know, re- responsible for backing up um, the systems from a BAU perspective, for example, and then now restoring all the systems. Because you have to remember that if servers have been damaged, well, it's now the systems guys, um, the systems team to now restore the servers themselves. Once the servers are operational, once everything is back to normal on that perspective, You now need to get the recovery team in place, the restoration team in place to now restore the operations and the systems and the data to those servers that have just been built up and you know brought back to life. Okay, so that's that's the role of these teams, team team members. Then we move into the structure. All right, so uh, this is who they are. So for example, Sue Helen, she's the director of shared services for this company. She's taking on the role of the DR director. So remember, this is the DR director. So now we get specific. Who is the DR director? Well, it's Sue Helen, and this is her details. So in the event of a disaster, Sue Helen may not be, um, you know, she may not be involved from, from an IT perspective at all. She could be, for example, a director as part of a shared services group, which is looking after uh, IT and finance and HR and other sorts of people-related um, companies or well, departments. And they don't have they don't have IT expertise, but they are going to be coordinating the entire event and working, of course, with the coordinator and the management team who may actually be members of the IT team. Right? Then you've got the well, the director of technology or the manager, the IT manager. Well, they're going to take on the role of the coordinator, but also they're a member of the management team, the systems, the backup, the network. All right, it's not not the ideal, but if you're working in a smaller company. The IT manager may do everything, so they're going to have on have multiple hats on in the event of a disaster. But I would recommend generally try to allocate these roles out accordingly, depending on the specialist uh, speciality of these particular individuals. Okay, so you want to have a list of all of these people and now specific of who they are. And of course, that's the importance of keeping this thing up to date because as staff come and go, as roles change, as people get promoted, etc., you may want to go into here and update this to make sure that it is up to date. Communication plan. Well, how is DR uh, initiated? All right. So, who says DRP is now um, done? We now need to in- in- invoke DRP. Uh, who does that? What is the contact method? In what order? Who do I contact and when? You know, you may need to include the directors and the board and the CEO as part of the communication plan. So, let's say, for example, um, a member of our, our server team has gone, hey, 
um, we're finding some very strange information um, being uh, identified within our domain controllers. And then a few minutes later, all your domain controllers go down and all of your servers start going down and all of your systems start going down. Well, that server guy, the server guy or girl has now identified this and they're gonna go and tell the IT manager, which could be you. It's not your responsibility to go and invoke DR at that stage. You will probably have to go and tell your boss who may need to then involve the CEO um, who then says, hey, we now need to invoke DR. This is a ma major issue. We need to get this thing back up and running. And that's what the communication plan sets out. And then that CEO will say, yep, invoke it. They get then the DRP uh, panel together. They may get the team structure together. The coordinator then starts to do everything and coordinating the relevant teams to go do what they need to do, okay? Alternate assembly location. So this could also be in your BCP, your business continuity plan, is where does staff go? What happens in the event of a disaster? Where does staff go um, during this particular event? Core system setup. So you wanna have a broken down right here of, well, where is all your systems? Okay, you want all of this information in here in one single location, again, for the purpose of, well, what if other information that you normally would access on servers, on the cloud, is no longer available because of an event that has happened. So you wanna include this in here all of your offices, do you have data in the cloud, do you have it in other data centers, uh, et cetera, okay? Then a bit of information around your hardware and system. So this could be a part of your export out of your asset register. So you may not need to include this, but this is just a high level. So I know that I've got 34 physical servers running ESXi set up with high availability, and I've also got 38 Cisco gigabit switches and four HP gigabit switches. So it's just more of a snapshot on what my infrastructure looks like. And then you would obviously use this in conjunction with your asset register, which has a lot more information inside of it, as well as at the location as needed. Then you've got some information around the RPO and the RTO. This is good to know and good to speculate, uh, stipulate. Uh, recovery point objective. So this is the time period allowed for data to be lost before it is not useful. So your email services, well, if I lose my data um, after 24 hours, it's no longer relevant to me, right? So you wanna speculate, stipulate, I keep saying speculate, stipulate uh, according to the actual recovery point objective for each item or each particular data system, data type, data within your organization. So go and look into RPO and RTO a little bit more if you wanna understand exactly what these are, but they're good to know. Uh, they're good to know. The RTO then is the time period allowed for services to be unavailable before a significant risk or losses are incurred. So for example, what happens if a single server goes down? Well, how long can that be down before it starts to have a major impact um, to operations? It may be two days. Now, you have a pool of domain controllers. You may have two or three domain controllers. Well, if one physical domain controller goes down, you could maybe go with a, your backup domain controller for two days and then after two days, well, you're gonna go, well, I've got no, no redundancy right now. So now it's gonna become a problem. So you may not be able to do that. But what if you have multiple physical server um, outages? Well, four hours may be as much as you can handle before it actually starts to have a financial impact against the organization, where you may need to send staff home, you're gonna start losing money, reputational risks, all this other sort of stuff, okay? RPO and RTO. Then we go into the incident type and response. This is now where we start to identify the incident type, the response and the recovery options to invoke DR led by the DR coordinator. And each incident scenario may require a varied response and resolution. So now we give you a brief summary on some incident types that may require somebody to invoke disaster recovery. So for example, the loss of the head office the loss of the primary data center, a major cyber attack, a major network failure, a major power uh, failure, loss of a core server or system, or an environmental pandemic or similar. So one of these events may actually lead the organization to trigger a disaster recovery event, okay? So that's that. These are the items. You could have others. Um, these, I would say, would be pretty standard across most organizations um, as a minimum, but you may want to get a little bit more granular. Potentially with this one, loss of a core system. Well, what is defined by a core server or system? You could potentially have a breakdown of some of these. What is a major power failure? Um, it could be broken into different sites. And of course, this gets very complicated depending on how many offices, how many locations um, you are uh, running in, okay? 
but there's some examples. And now we're gonna go down and break down each of these because each of these will require a different um, response and recovery, okay? So now you wanna go into detail around each of these because a loss of a head office will be different to a major power outage, could be different to a loss of a core server. So the action, the response and the recovery may be different for each of these, okay? We then go into detail now around, well, what is each team member going to be doing? Now, what I'd recommend is you do almost like a copy and paste job of an incident response and recovery based on each incident type. So each incident type will have a different response required. So you may wanna go very granular and say, well, look, the loss of a head office, this is the response and the recovery strategy that we're going to take to be able to recover a head office loss. And then you'll do the same thing for each different type because you don't want to be doing certain events. You don't want to go and restore um, your networking switches if your loss of your head office you know, was due to flooding, but your servers are all underwater, but your switches are all fine. Okay, so you may not need to go and buy new switches, for example. So you're going to sort of cater this accordingly. But then we want to break down specifically around what is each particular uh, member going to now do. So the coordinator will do this. They will be responsible for informing the CEO, seeking confirmation on Invoke and DR, and then they're going to be responsible for now, let's get the management team together. They organize a communication plan. The management team gets together. They then start taking direction from the coordinator. The management team also is now responsible for managing and getting together, calling everybody in the networks, the systems, the backup teams, saying, guys, we need to do this, coordinating the entire event together with the coordinator, of course, but each group will have their own task, their own responsibility. So the IT network team, well, they're gonna take direction from the management team members and overall direction from the coordinator, but now they're responsible for restoring the network. They may need to assess the damage, they need to go and look at potentially procuring new equipment if they need to, reconfiguring things, reconfiguring things, uh, going to their backups, reconfiguring those switches, getting the config back up and running, getting all of our switches, all, you know, all of our ports across all of our, our building, maybe recabled if there's been damage, whatever it may be, it's gonna be very, very different for each one. And of course, this is something that's gonna be catered specific to your organization, depending on what equipment you've got. And what I'd recommend is in here, get very specific. Get specific around switch A is gone down, you wanna do this, this, and this. Switch B is now down, you need to do this, this, and this. The server has gone down. This is what we need to do to restore it, recover it, restore the data, etc. Okay, so you get very specific now around the response and the recovery um, against a particular disaster recovery scenario. After things have been restored, you now have an area here where I like to have our uh, post-incident review. So after everything has been restored, perhaps a few days later or a week later, you get your group together your panel together, perhaps your disaster recovery team together, and you sit down and you start discussing the event. What happened? What worked well? What didn't work well? What can we do better? What systems can we put in place so that this doesn't happen again? You now form a plan and you just be very open and frank to sort of go through the entire event to understand the findings and then make sure that next time things are done in a different way. List of all of our key contacts that are relevant. Um, generally, you're gonna have this stuff in the BCP. An IT contact list document could be part of the pack as well. We have specific service providers and vendors and suppliers, but again, this all could be part of a BCP or a separate contact document altogether. Then we've got some appendices. Uh, here, I'd like to include some further information. Again, for the purpose of, well, let's say some digital versions of all of this has been damaged. We wanna have a copy of this perhaps in a printed form or in this pack but your WAN diagrams so that you know exactly how to build things up. Very easy to see straight away. Uh, this is how my network is built. The IPs, the links, the tunnels, the speed of my links, all of that. The rack diagrams, head office, remote racks, your, your cloud system setups, anything that is now technical that gives you a good snapshot of a technical setup for all of your environments. All right, there you have the disaster recovery plan. This is a simple template 
completely customizable to you. So that's it. Thank you so much for spending the time and taking the time to watch this video today. Hopefully you learned something new. Please let me know in the comments below what you thought. And as always, like and subscribe, clicking on my face right over there so that you don't miss out on anything and on the subscription button so that you get notified when I release new videos around all things tech.